gather together and worship together. If you are visiting with us, we're so glad that you're here. And just want to welcome you to the services here at Life Christian Church and uh, draw your attention to the bulletin that you picked up when you came in the door. Uh, on the edge of that little perforated flap, we call it the connection card. If you wouldn't mind filling that out for us, just so we can have a record of your attendance here with us today. And if you would, drop it in the offering plate, which is just to the left of the double doors there. And if you are visiting with us, that's the only thing we want you to put in the plate as we view this time together as our gift to you. Now on the back side of that, of course, something there for everybody. It's a place for prayer requests. And uh, we are a praying church. We'd love to have the opportunity to pray with you and to pray for you. So you can put your prayer requests there. Or any updates that you happen to have allows us to keep our list as current as possible. Uh, as far as announcements go, have a few of them this morning. One, since this is Apple Park weekend, there is no youth group tonight uh, here at church. Youth group will pick up again next week. Uh, April is out this morning, but she handed me a uh, an announcement. There is a sign-up sheet in the gathering area for the bizarre lunch items. If you are not a cracker or a cook, here's your chance to contribute to the bizarre benefit oblong. So October the 29th, items are needed by October the 27th. So if you'd like to help with that, there is a sign-up sheet out in the uh, out in the gathering area. Clary, you want to turn me down? I don't know why this is coming through super, super loud. All right. And we are now down, can you believe it, we're down to the last quarter of the year. I don't know where 2022 is gone, but 2023 is going to be here before we know it. But it is the beginning of a new quarter next week, so it's time to pass the uh, clipboards again for uh, hospitality snacks, for greeters, and for, uh, for cleaning. So we'll pass two of them this morning, starting over here. And since we're uh, low this morning due to Apple and Port, we will pass them again next week as well. All right, any other announcements? This morning, Roger. I've got four boxes, three or four boxes of tomatoes outside the door there. This will probably be the last Sunday I'll have tomatoes. Thank you. All right. So, if you like garden fresh tomatoes, this is your Sunday to get them. And the box out there in front of the door. And uh, before the praise team starts, uh, we do have one more announcement. So, and Marcus, when you're done. Hey, Marcus, check the button and see if it's on. Yep. Right. Okay. So, just wanted to come up here and kind of uh, let you guys know of some recent developments in my life. Uh, just put it plainly, uh, I have accepted the call to be the senior minister. Uh, so, I will be transitioning out of my role here at Lane at the end of October. Uh, I will be uh, pastoring a church in Paxton. I'll be at Paxton Church of Christ. But, uh, just thought it was good for to let you guys know that I will be transitioning out of my role and then moving up into a senior ministry role. If you have any questions, just let me know. Uh, we love you guys. We miss you guys. But I just feel like that's um, where God's calling us to in this season. So we're excited, but it's definitely a bittersweet thing. Uh, we love you guys very much.
Chronicles 5, 11 to 13, we read, The trumpeters and singers performed together in unison as one to praise and give thanks to the Lord. Accompanied by trumpets, cymbals, and other instruments, they raised their voices and praised the Lord with words, these words, He is so good, His faithful love endures forever. At that moment, a cloud filled the temple of the Lord. The priests did not continue their work because the glorious presence of the Lord filled the temple of God. 
morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. A famous TV quote, which I'm pretty good at remembering, is I love it when a plan comes together. I do not like it when plans don't come together. If you guys are anything like me, you come up with a great idea, but you think it's a great idea, and you can't get to work. It will not work. I do. It drives me nuts every time. When I work, I, I mean, I'm not much of a planner. I really am not. So when I actually plan something, I want it to work right. And when it doesn't, I get super frustrated. About the only thing that I really plan out is writing assignments, in this case, community meditations. I'll get an idea, either a verse or a story or something that happened recently, and I'll try and build a meditation around that. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes I'll write something down, it's like, okay, yeah, this, this is good. Then I'll read it and go, hmm, love that one. Sometimes you'll see me sitting right over there, and writing stuff down, trying to get to work, and being like, one more verse. And sometimes it works, super rare occasions. I just sit there and I stare at the paper, nothing happens. This was one of those occasions. <laughs> I, I had a great story that would have worked better last week for memories of building a church about how a rainy, rainy day in 2004 led to our stage being designed the way it is. But I could not fit community meditations around that story, no matter how hard I tried. I tried forcing it in, it's like, yeah, I'm just going to start with this story, and then we'll jump to something else. That, that, didn't, that didn't work, that didn't like that. I tried finding a Bible verse that, hey, this is stage building, it's not really covering the Bible, but it does fit me. But when I was scrolling through trying to find a verse, I came across Proverbs 19.21. Many are the plans in the mind of a man, but it's the purpose of the Lord that will stand. How often do we get so focused on our own ideas and plans, doing what we think is best, what we think is a good idea, that we lose focus on God? Do we try to shove our own plans or ideas into His? I know I do. Most of the time, it does not work out for us. Fortunately, the one who created the universe is much better at getting things done than I am. His plans always work out, even when we try to help. Ephesians 2 8, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works or plans. Our best plans can't compare with His, and at this time of communion,
It takes a lot of time. I'm pretty sure everybody here has probably worked at one point or another. Some of you for many years. It's, uh, it's kind of nice. The years you don't have to work, but you can just kind of go do your thing, come home, and <laughs> forever, and get everything together. I know the pastor is just absolutely whoops from getting everything together with the scouts, but everything it's going well. They're selling out. That's excellent. It's a perfect weekend. All right, several praises. Um, we celebrated a little bit last week, um, obviously, for everyone that was a part of the mortgage elimination ceremony. And uh, Ollie's got a great idea. He took his little strip and laminated it. So it's a perfect bookmark. Marty Benson, doing well, obviously. He didn't drop me of any 50, but he did well. Charlie Mandrell is back in church. And I suppose, found out his name. Anyway, uh, my Aunt Catherine, prayers have been answered. She is uh, more bedfast now, but she's doing well. The, Whatever was causing the blood loss to stop, and she no longer has COVID. Michael Walner is doing well after his back surgery. In fact, he drove his wife, Tony, up to Chicago for a doctor's appointment. And anybody who can drive Chicago is a hero in my movie. <laughs> Don't mind driving big city stuff. Any other praises? So Vinny might be able to go home or go outside. No, no, no distractions. Gotcha. Well, what a perfect day to sit outside in the fresh air. Well, good. So many is definitely improving then.
So he was okay when they were still. surgery going on here. But the way it's been going as far as the Thanksgiving has been very successful. So we agree for that. <laughs> Katie kicking. That's <laughs> very nice.
problem then? Yeah. One of the reasons why God put the church together. So as the body of Christ, we can support each other. I'm sorry for being a tattletale, but that's Well, sometimes it's a good thing. We need to have We have our Father, we just give you praise and thanksgiving for who you are. We are so grateful that you care so much about us. You care about everything that we do, when we say these things. You comfort us when we are hurting. You strengthen us when we are weak. You support us when we make false decisions. You correct us. And get us back on track when we lose our way. We know, Heavenly Father, that your goodness, your mercy, your grace are so important. Your forgiveness, your healing, your deliverance. We so depend upon you, sir. As you live in our hearts and you spread your love about us. As you strengthen us individually and as a body of Christ. Father, we just ask that your hand of healing and deliverance, Jehovah God, would be upon us. That it would be upon um, every injury, uh, back surgeries and falls and strokes and loneliness. And just give us comfort. We just thank you, Father, for touching each one mentioned here today. Bringing them fresh, a fresh anointing. Touching their lives, their hearts, their minds, their bodies. Delivering, restoring, strengthening, healing. And we just thank you that we can come to you this way. We can praise you for the weather and for the events that have gone forth, but we can also come to you as members of this church, ask for your intercession on behalf of our brothers and sisters. Even when we're not supposed to be Father, you just love us so much. And you give us the strength and the direction to do what we should. We're here to support you. And we just give you praise and thanksgiving for the healings that we've heard. And we just ask, Father, that you would continue to bless and heal each one mentioned, each heart, each body, each mind. We just praise you and thank you. In the name of your precious Son, Jesus, our Savior and our Lord.
have any television, but what I did have was my Bible. And so I spent a good deal of time reading it. And uh, it's something that I encourage everybody to do uh, on a regular basis. But I decided that, well, I've got this time in the afternoon to read. Uh, I'm going to sit down and take it by word count. I'm going to read the longest book in the Bible, which is the book of Isaiah. And as I'm reading through, there was a passage of Scripture, and I've shared it in here several times, uh, that just stuck with me on that day. And it has stuck with me ever since. Uh, so if you have your Bibles with you this morning, go to the book of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 58, verse 10. To be honest, until I read it that hot afternoon, it was a verse that I don't think I had ever seen before. But it put into perspective what I was doing, and to be honest, it puts into perspective what I spent the next 25 years doing, and I think as Christians, it gives us some direction. It simply says this, If you pour yourself out for the hungry and satisfy the desire of the afflicted, then your light shall rise in darkness, and your gloom shall become like the new day. Now, if that's not a passage of Scripture focused on discipleship and evangelism, which is what we have talked about uh, the most over the course of this year. I don't know what is. Uh, you give yourself, you pour yourself out to others uh, by what you say and by what you do. So that has become my favorite Bible verse. Now, a lot of people, even those that don't go to church, have a favorite Bible verse. It's a verse that they know is in the Bible. They quote it regularly, but often they have no idea what it means. And I think sometimes even we in the church will quote this Bible verse and have absolutely no idea what exactly Jesus is getting at when he makes that statement. Our text for this morning is Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 through 5. But unfortunately, when this passage of Scripture gets quoted, more often than not, this is what we do with it. Matthew chapter 7. We read the first two words. Judge not. And then we scribble out the rest of it. It's called proof texting. It's called taking a little piece of scripture, maybe even a passage of scripture, because we do realize and remember, don't we, that... The Bible, when it's originally written, has no verses, has no chapters. They were put in just to help us find things easier. And so, whenever we read Scripture, we have to read it in its proper context. We read Matthew chapter 7, verse 1, the first two words of it, as if it were one of the Ten Commandments. As if God had sent it down from on high to Moses himself. And most of the time it comes up when we are trying to justify some bad behavior. And let's be honest, we all do it. In fact, as a preacher, if I had a nickel for every time I heard somebody utter the words, judge not, I wouldn't be here this morning. I would be retired in a cabin in South Dakota, and we would not be having this conversation. That's how often it gets used. Anytime you point out anything, regardless of reason, anytime you point out anything that is negative, anything that is wrong, in the life of another person, the response is, don't judge me, you judgy judger. The Bible says you can't do it. Well, let's read that passage for just a second. Matthew chapter 7, verse 1, page 812, if you're following along in the sanctuary Bible. Judge not that you be not judged. Okay? Sounds pretty cut and dry, doesn't it? That we're not supposed to judge other people. Uh -huh. Well, let's read the rest of the story as the rabbis would tell us to do if we want to understand it. For with 
the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you see the speck in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when there is a log in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. So there's a whole lot more to play in this passage than just simply not judging. And here's what it comes down to. Scripture doesn't tell us not to judge. It tells us not to pass inappropriate judgment. Because let's be honest, we make judgment calls all the time, don't we? Some of those judgment calls are easy. Others are more difficult. But at the heart of it all is this simple fact. Our culture, and the church often is influenced by the culture, has conflated two connected yet not synonymous terms. Judgment and condemnation. If you're taking notes, write that down. Judgment and condemnation. Now while condemnation may come on the other side of judgment, it's not the same as judgment. And there are two different roles to be played here. It's the same way in the legal system because they are legal terms. The jury passes judgment, finds you guilty, who issues the condemnation? The judge. Two parts to play, two roles to play. It's the same for us. We make judgment calls. This is right, this is wrong. But when it comes to laying out whether there's condemnation or not, that's God's place. That's not ours. We are to hold each other accountable. We are to love each other. And you do realize that accountability is actually part of love. We get this crazy idea that love is just this this feeling that we get that makes our heart beat really fast? No. Love. Doing what is best for the other person regardless of whether it's reciprocated or not. And accountability is part of that process. It's also part of the process of church membership. Why are we part of the body of Christ? Well, part of it is, is accountability. As a, a, as a staff here at the church, we as staff answer to the elders. And it is a mutual relationship going back and forth. I am accountable to them. They are accountable to me. We hold each other accountable. It's the same way for the body of Christ. God puts us in each other's lives to help one another, to love one another. And part of that is to hold each other accountable. Depending on the context, the word judge... The word krino in the Greek denotes either evaluation and analysis or condemnation and punishment. In this context, it is actually the first one. We're not talking about the legal proceedings. That's how it lays out quite a bit. But here, it's simply talking about evaluation and analysis. How you look at another person, how you look at how they behave, and what they do. Now let's just get this out of the way, and I've used this terminology, and it's a term that I rather enjoy using because sometimes it catches people off guard. And it's simply this, nobody likes a jerk for Jesus. The Pharisees were jerks for God. They tried to micromanage your life, and it was looking out, looking out, and never looking in. And that's why Jesus gives the explanation that he does. The speck in the log? Believe it or not, there is a comedic aspect to this passage. When, when, when you read it in the, in the context of the whole story, and I encourage you to do so. And I'll just put this out here. 
This is part of the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, at the beginning of next year, starting in January, the Sunday School class that meets here in the sanctuary will be starting a lesson series on the Sermon on the Mount. And we're going to tear into it. We're going to go through it, book, chapter, and verse, through the sermon itself and the chapters that follow it, which talk about Jesus and provide its, south, er, provide its foundation. So I encourage you to do that. So now my plug is done. We'll go back to the text here. And we will dig into this passage of scripture. The log and the speck. As I read it, I can only imagine that here is Jesus teaching that he literally picks up a stick, a log, and puts it up against his face. Here, brother, let me help you remove that speck. Well, what happens if you have that log? You can't even get the same zip code as the brother that's got the speck. Now, is Jesus telling you not to judge? No. What he's telling you to do is self-evaluation is always the first step in judgment. It says, by the manner you judge, you will be judged. So, self-reflection is always necessary. We look at scripture for guidance in conflict resolution. And we get good guidance right here in the Gospel of Matthew. What do you do? Well, if you have a conflict, you go to that person. If they don't listen, then you take a couple others. If they don't listen, then you take it to the church. And so on and so forth. But tied up into that, and coming from this, which comes a little earlier in Jesus' teaching, is this concept of self-reflection. Anytime there is a conflict, Anytime there is something that's going on in somebody else's life and you are in a relationship with them, self-reflection is always the first part. Look at yourself first. You ever point finger at somebody? It can be a, a useful thing. There were times when my kid was little. They did something you weren't supposed to. All they had to do was go like that, and it was, ooh, and that's not good. But... Notice the fact that when you're pointing a finger at somebody, you've got three other fingers that are pointing right back at you. He's there for a reason. And also, when we get down to it, dealing with this concept of the speck and the log, accountability only comes through relationship. Another thing that we get out of the context. It's not your place to hold people you don't know accountable. Oh yeah, you can, you can make judgment calls. You can look at society and in general, and say, okay, there's something out of whack, and it doesn't take us much to look at our society and know that there are things that are not right. And we can evaluate, and we can draw basic conclusions, but when it comes to individuals, we have no right to point out their missteps face-to-face -face if you do not have a relationship with them. Why? Because it doesn't carry weight. Oh, it may very well be true, and you can speak to it in generalities. But when accountability comes, accountability can only truly come when you are in a relationship with that person. And so here's the thing. I know you guys. I love you guys. I've been here. It's hard to believe it. I've been here for almost 10 years. Relationships have been built. But have you ever noticed that I never call anybody out? individually on Sunday morning. There's a reason for that. That's not how the accountability works. Although there is a meme that flies around the internet quite often, and I do believe that it is true. A lot of times my preacher friends share it. Somebody comes up to the preacher and says, you know what? I didn't know you were going to preach a sermon about me this morning, preacher. And the preacher's like, I didn't preach that sermon about you, but if the shoe fits, wear it, Cinderella. <laughs> it's true. That's what scripture is there for. To guide us, to direct us, but also to convict us. It's all about appropriate behavior. Believe it or not, it's at the very core of Christian ethics. It's something that has been lost. Beginning of last year, I preached a sermon, an entire series 
on the parable of the Good Samaritan talking about Christian ethics. And part of it is, is that when you love somebody, it's irrelevant to the conversation how they ended up in the ditch. It's irrelevant to the conversation how they ended up where they're at. What it is, is we are called to love, we are called to support, and we are called to hold accountable. So why do we think that it's wrong to judge? Well, it's simply this. I think in a lot of situations, one, when looking at the world and the world looking back at us, we just simply don't want to be told what to do. We don't like to be told what to do. And then from the Christian perspective, looking at ourselves and looking at each other, we don't want to judge other people simply because we are keenly aware of our own faults. We are keenly aware of our own sinfulness. I mean, I struggle with it. I assume you do as well, where it's like, okay, I did good today. Or at other times, it's like, okay, man, I really blew it there. But I look at the Apostle Paul. Here's this guy who writes the vast majority of our New Testament. And how does he identify himself? I'm the chief of sinners. Do you have any idea how much comfort that passage of Scripture brings me? Not that I ever want anybody to sin, but I'm sitting here going, okay, so if I struggle with it, if, 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 if Paul is struggling with it, okay, that helps me handle it just a little bit better. Because we don't like sin. And with good reason. We're not supposed to like it. It's our natural tendency to avoid any talk of it. It's our natural tendency to ignore it as a topic. In fact, you know in the, in, in the church, and for us, those of us that are preachers, there are three topics that are kind of called taboo topics to talk about. Money, sin, and hell. And sin has a twin brother, which is repentance, which is supposed to come after. Most unpopular sermons ever preached, but we have to preach them. But society doesn't want to hear it. Let's be honest, the church probably doesn't want to hear it either. And so we have become, we have, we have, we've come to the point that we start beating this drum. And it's a huge word in our day and age. It is the word tolerance. And here's the crazy thing. Up until about, oh, I don't know, 20 or 25 years ago, the word tolerance was a perfectly acceptable word to use. It was a good word. It was a needed word. The problem is, and this is where the, uh, the philologist, the, the word nerd in me, gets irritated. While the meanings of words change over, the, over time, Tolerance is one of those words that has been deliberately changed for nefarious purposes. And that drives me nuts because it wasn't a natural progression. Years ago, you go back and you, you look up the word tolerance in most of your dictionaries. And I'll paraphrase this. Tolerance. Allowing the other person to be wrong without holding it against them. Allowing another person to be wrong without holding it against them. It's like, okay, you have a wrong perspective, you have a wrong position, but I am not going to condemn you personally for that position. I will disagree with what you're doing, but I will not condemn you as an individual. I don't know if any of you remember back in the days when the Catholic Bishop Fulton Sheen was on television. If you ever get a chance, look him up on YouTube. A lot of what he says is very fitting for today's world because he talked about the change in the culture that was coming. And in one of the episodes of this show, he talked about the concept of tolerance and he laid it out this way. Tolerance. Always for the individual, never, never for the aberrant idea. Intolerance, never 
for the individual, but always for the abhorrent idea. See, we've taken tolerance and intolerance, and we've switched it from the individual to the idea, from the idea to the individual. In our world, tolerance is simply defined as agreeing with what I do. And in fact, it used to be when it started out, when that change first started, it was accepting what I do, you know, or ignoring it. Ignoring it, accepting it, but in today's world, tolerance is you not only have to accept and embrace what I do, you have to celebrate what I do. And then lies the problem. Because when we buy into that type of mindset, and it is a philosophical mindset, that philosophy begins to drive how we interpret Scripture. It begins to shade our glasses, so to speak, in how we read what the Word of God says. And the church is not immune to it. In fact, today there are numerous churches, church bodies, that have embraced those things which Scripture blatantly calls sin. Well-meaning, but misguided. Because we have to love everybody. Well, yes, we have to love everybody, but you have misdefined what love actually is. Sin never becomes not sin simply because it's accepted by a majority. That's not the way that God works. So keys to right judgment. Number one, the standard we use is the standard that God will use on us. The Pharisees missed that. That's one of the reasons why a lot of times this is addressed to those scribes and the Pharisees, the ones that come up with all of these other you know, ancillary laws and guidelines that help you keep the law and actually keeps you from keeping the law the way that you're supposed to. Number two, we need to worry about our sins before we look at the sins of others. Now, does that mean that we can never make a judgment call because we have sin in our life? No. But here's what I will say. I had a friend of mine point this out to me when he was preaching and teaching on this passage of Scripture, Matthew 5 through 7. It's simply this. Part of the context of it is if you are holding a brother accountable on something for a sin that they have in their life, you have no room to speak if it's something you're struggling with too. <clears throat> Except to maybe say, hey, I'm right there with you. So are we to to judge, to make observations, sure, but we don't point those observations out. That sin is the same as something that we're struggling with. Except to reach out to them, put our arm around them, and go, yep, I'm right there with you. And then, of course, the third one is, and this is another one that I think we miss, don't judge what God is silent on. Oftentimes we, uh, we, we make our own ideas about stuff. Then we go to look for passages of scripture to back up what we believe. And I think that's a lot of times where we run into our own problems, at least as Christians. Because instead of reading scripture and deriving our positions from it, we set our positions and then go try to find scripture to match it. That's called ice of Jesus. Forcing scripture to say what it doesn't. It's bad theology. And so let's look at it. some of the things over the years that the church has taken issue with. Oh, things like dancing and tattoos and smoking and drinking and playing cards. All have been vigorously defended and condemned over the years. Now, are those things necessarily good for you? Yeah, maybe, maybe not. But they're wholly subjective. In fact, on my shelf in my office... I have a, a book of sermons written by probably one of the greatest evangelists of the early 20th century. He was a fantastic guy. 
But at the core, he even admitted so later in life, the guy was a legalist to the core. And so he preached sermons on dancing and tattoos and smoking and drinking and playing cards. What are those sermons? Here's a title for you. How merrily we go to hell. Wow. Talk about hellfire and brimstone preaching. Well, there may be a place. We should never downplay scripture. Hell is real. Hell is hot. Hell is a place of punishment. But we can't say there are going to be things that send you there when the Bible doesn't say that. So, make sure that we're not putting our own cultural standards on top of Scripture and making them as high. And also this. That's the fourth one. We can't expect the world to live the way the church does. Oh yeah, we can want it. We as Christians, I believe we should endeavor to influence culture. Nothing about setting up some sort of quasi-theocracy. We are to be in the public square. We are to be the hands and feet of Jesus. But at the same time, we can never expect the world to live as Christians do because, well, the world is not Christian. We are to influence them, not the other way around. So, when there's a point of application to this, it's simply this. When considering the actions of others, keep in mind your failures and your shortcomings. It will take you and carry you a long way. Praise team, go ahead and come back up. We're going to wrap up for this morning uh, with our takeaway. And it's simply this. We're all undeserving recipients of God's great grace. So don't give it out of shape when people sin differently than you do. End of story. So what do we do with it? Well, I'll end with this passage from the Apostle Paul. Galatians chapter 6, verse 1 and 2. Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him with the spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. And to be honest, I can't add anything else to it. Other than that, we come down here to the end of our service. Hey, it's all about Jesus. How do you want to judge right? Eh, look at Jesus. He's always our best example. So we ask the question, we ask it twice, what are you going to do with Jesus? First one's the question of salvation. Have you accepted him as your Lord and Savior? If you haven't, that's the place that you start. If you're looking for answers, he's the one that has the answers. We may not get every answer that we want on this side of eternity, but we get the answer to the most important question, and that is how we can live our lives and where we will spend eternity. And then, of course, on the other side of that is what are you going to do with Jesus? That question of evangelism. Am I going to keep Jesus to myself or am I going to take him and share him with the world? It's up to us. Those are the calls. If there's any decision this morning, we invite you to come as we stand and sing.
together to, to celebrate, to share communion together, to worship God and study from his word. Go ahead and reach out, grab a hand with the person next to you, and we'll ask God's blessing on our week. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord God, we just thank you for this day. We thank you for this time that we've had together, this uh, beautiful day that indeed you have made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Be with us this week as we go out. Put somebody in our path that we can share you with, that we will be able to have the opportunity, those divine appointments, to be your hands and to be your feet. We thank you for the blessings of life, but most importantly for your son Jesus. And it's in his powerful name we pray all of these things. Amen. 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 Have a great week, everybody.